Welcome to a world where nothing is as it seems. Welcome to Fake Britain. Get on! Get on! The floor now. So put your hands behind your back now! Here at the Fake Britain House, we'll reveal the fakes that are flooding the market, conning people like you and me and making money for the criminals. We'll investigate the fraudsters who are selling us something that isn't real and could be dangerous and will help you avoid falling for a fake. Today on Fake Britain, the fake mattress that won't leave you with a spring in your step. I'm guessing that is supposed to be my memory phone. I don't think there's any memory in that. The fake laser pens causing havoc in the sky and on the ground. I was shining it around, this blur just came into my eye. There's a hole in his eye from the laser pen. The fake airport valet service that took one man's car for a joyride. And the way that they were driving quite easily killed somebody or had a serious accident. And the fake car racing harness, putting drivers' lives at risk. You can break your neck, break your arms, legs, doesn't bear thinking about it. If you want to get a good night's sleep, get a good mattress, so many people say. And a good one can cost hundreds of pounds. Well worth it if you think you'll get those quality 40 winks. But not all is as it seems in the land of Nod. We've discovered the length some fakers will go to to sell us a fake mattress. We spend a third of our lives in bed and we spend millions each year on mattresses. A good double mattress can cost from £500 upwards, going into the thousands. But the fakers are giving some customers a rude awakening. Come on. Sarah Hewlett from Worcester was in need of a new one, and opportunity was about to knock. A van pulled up, a very nice man, asked if we were interested in buying a mattress. Dreams mattress looked lovely, and the RRP on it was £899 and he offered it for, to me for 130. The salesman said the mattress contained high-quality memory foam and the label said it was made by a well-known British company called Dreams. It was a bargain. Mattress isn't the most exciting thing. I didn't really want to spend that much money on it and to get a good quality mattress at that price I would have been a fool not to take it. Sarah was particularly tempted by the memory foam, which moulds to the shape of your body to give extra support as you sleep. So she bought the mattress and began sleeping on it. But when she showed it to a friend, he was concerned. He was like, how much have you paid for this? I said, I've paid £130, it's supposed to be 899 I said, it's a memory foam. And he's like, that's not a memory foam. Now highly suspicious of her new mattress, Sarah decided to seek advice online looked on the internet and then you read all the scams you know man pulls up in van office says he needs to offload so he can get home every box was ticked as in i'd been done i'd been scammed on a mattress sarah began to fear the worst but she needed to be sure i was still hoping it wasn't a fake mattress so i took some photos and i emailed dreams and I received an email to say it definitely wasn't one of theirs. Sarah hadn't bought a high-end memory foam mattress. She had, in fact, bought a fake. She immediately contacted the seller to return it and get a refund. He got quite abusive on the phone, said I was very wrong, that it was what he said it was. He wouldn't give me an address and then put the phone down on me. The mattress Sarah bought was labelled to look like one from leading bed brand Dreams. Mike Logue is the chief executive. He's furious that fakers have targeted his company's products and are duping customers on their own doorsteps. This is not just a Dreams issue, this is an industry issue, where we have people knocking on doors, selling mattresses, and then the customers contacting us after that period to let us know uh, that they've been duped. The problem is widespread. Well, there goes the Dreams van. Here, surveillance footage shows a fake Dreams van brazenly being driven around. 
dreams have confirmed. This is not one of their vehicles. These fakers are quite sophisticated. We refreshed our brand logo uh, just over two years ago. And within three weeks, I had pictures of vans sent to me with our new logo on them, on these fake vehicles. The authorities are working hard to crack down on the sellers of fake mattresses. At Enfield Trading Standards in North London, they recently received a tip-off about yet another door-to-door -door salesman thought to be selling fake Dreams mattresses. Carl Schultz led the investigation. We had a phone call from the police. An individual by the name of Elias Stanley was involved in an altercation with a resident in the area when he was going around trying to sell mattresses door-to-door. -door. Trading Standards seized the mattress seller's van which was branded with the Dreams logo. The police made inquiries with Dreams and they became aware that Elias was not an employee of Dreams Limited and the vehicle was not part of the fleet. Elias Stanley was posing as a genuine Dreams salesman when, in fact, he was a fake. Trading standards were informed and they set up a trap. They invited Stanley to come in and collect his van. He turned up with his father, Fred Stanley, they had arrived in a separate van uh, which was liveried up with slumber dreams and they were wearing clothing with the dreams logo on it. The two vans were searched and trading standards found 21 mattresses, all branded with the dreams logo. Both father and son were arrested. They were essentially caught red-handed. They had mattresses in the back of two vans with fake dreams logos on. They were wearing clothing with fake dreams logo and the fans were liveried up with the Dreams logo when they are not employees of it. The mattresses had been bought unbranded from a budget supplier for around £75 each. The Stanleys then added fake Dreams labels and sold them on for up to £999 each, potentially a 1,200% markup. The pair were charged with offences under the Trademarks Act. They pleaded guilty and received fines totalling three and a half thousand pounds. It's quite satisfying to know that we've removed these products from the markets in this case and that the uh, perpetrators have been punished accordingly. And it's not just the Dreams brand that's being faked. Jessica Atkinson is director of the National Bed Federation, which represents the UK bed industry. She regularly investigates reports of fake mattresses and makes test purchases to try and keep one step ahead of the fakers. We bought this off the internet. It's described as a 3,000 pocket spring memory foam mattress. Pocket springs are individually wrapped springs that move independently in a mattress, providing extra comfort. The more springs, the more luxurious the mattress. But is this one a fake? There's only one way to find out. Look inside. We've opened it up, and what we've discovered is it doesn't have 3,000 pocket springs in it. In fact, it's just got 644 springs. It's a very basic, lowest possible quality pocket spring unit. This mattress has less than a fifth of the number of springs that it was advertised as having. What about the memory foam? We were told this had a luxury deep layer of memory foam, 25 to 50 millimetres deep. Well, as you can see, it is at best six or seven millimetres, which isn't really enough to produce any of the benefits which people look for when they're buying memory foam and expect. The mattress is a fake and not a very good one. I think this confirms that uh, companies like this are deliberately misleading people because they know most of us are not going to cut open our mattresses to check. So, as far as they're concerned, getting the sale is more important than telling the truth. Paying too much for an uncomfortable fake mattress could be the least of a consumer's worries. Back at Dreams, Mike Logue is concerned that the sellers of fake mattresses could be putting people in danger. Let's be clear, reputable retailers do not sell uh, mattresses door to door. There is no protection in that. So customers put themselves at risk buying these products. Some fakers have been found to be selling used mattresses up to 10 years old, recovered to look like new, and then sold as genuine high end products. That is just appalling that a new cover would be put on an old mattress, and the health implications for that 
of people breathing, you know, during their sleep. For Sarah, who was duped into buying a fake Dreams mattress, the idea is horrifying. The thought of what could be on that mattress just doesn't bear thinking about. You just think of, like, bodily fluids, fleas. To put her mind at rest, Sarah's decided to cut open her fake mattress to see what's really inside. Springs. Not very big springs, but we have springs. That blue, I'm guessing that is what's supposed to be my memory foam. I don't think there's any memory in that. <laughs> Does that look like a £899 mattress? Um, no. Fake mattresses pose another, more serious safety risk. You can expect a genuine mattress from a reputable retailer to be fully fire retardant. It's the law. But if you buy a fake, there's no guarantee it will meet the same standards. This is a huge issue for the consumer. It could be the fire retardancy isn't there. It would only take one mattress that, that isn't fire retardant um, to have an issue in this country, and we, we would all know about it. Here on Fake Britain, we've seen how some fake mattresses are seriously dangerous. In this flammability test carried out by Lancashire Fire and Rescue, the genuine mattress on the left self-extinguished quickly, while the fake on the right went up in flames and continued to burn fiercely. If one of these fakes were to be involved in a house fire, the consequences could be catastrophic. Despite the potential risks, for now, Sarah is stuck with her fake mattress. I've had to keep the mattress because I haven't been able to afford to replace it. And yeah, every time I go to bed, I'm like reminded that I've bought a fake mattress. This may look like a pen, but it's not. It's actually a laser, the sort that's often used for teaching or giving presentations. But because it's a laser, there are very strict rules on the strength of the beam that's being sold. A powerful laser is potentially very dangerous. The power is usually indicated on the label here, but these labels are being faked. And that means lasers powerful enough to cause very serious damage to eyesight could be on sale on a high street near you. Laser pens come in all different shapes and sizes. And when it comes to the size, they're getting bigger, more powerful and more dangerous. Johnny Marshall and his mum Angela were at a local fair when they saw one that Johnny wanted to buy. I had been asking about this laser pen for um, about the last 20 minutes. He has had laser pointers before. He's very curious. And to be honest, when we bought it, didn't really think anything of it. Keen to play with his new gadget, Johnny powered it up the moment he got it home. I was shining it around, and I shone it in my eye to see like um, how strong it was. And then um, about a quarter of a second later, I blinked. And then I realised this blur just came into my eye, like a purpley, bluey, black spot. Johnny thought maybe he was just a bit dazzled by the laser pen. So I left it for two days to just go away, but actually it didn't. Whenever I was focusing, like, maybe small writing, this blur just kept going over what I was focusing on. Um, and and I, I kept trying to blink it away. But when Johnny's blurred vision didn't improve, Mum Angela phoned an optician. I've got to come in. I said, I'll just wait. They were very, very good. They took some pictures and they said that there was a mark at the back of his eye. And um, they sent us straight to Moorfields Eye Hospital, where I had to get it checked with um, the proper, like, computer scanner and take pictures of my eye. The laser pen had seriously damaged Johnny's left eye. There's a hole in his eye anyway. There will always be a hole in his eye, and that will never disappear from the laser pen. Angela thinks that things could have been a lot worse if he hadn't been wearing glasses at the time. The light was slightly refracted, and they believe that actually could have been what saved his eye. If my glasses um, weren't that thick and strong, um, then um, th then I could actually have been blind. It was millimetres away from the central vision. Johnny now has to have regular eye examinations at Moorfields, a specialist eye hospital in London. It's cleared up a small bit, but we're not sure if the gap will close up 
or if it would just stay um, as a small blur. After the accident, Angela looked more closely at the laser pen and it became clear it should never have been on sale. It was labelled as being one milliwatt in power, which is the legal limit for laser pens to be sold in this country. But in fact, it was much more powerful than that. The laser it was a class 3B laser. It's up to 500 milliwatts. And that's why it's actually done all the damage to his eye. We're angry because it was sold on a pocket money stall, six pounds. And if it hadn't been faked, it would never have happened. You don't know what you're getting. They can be fake goods. And that's what the one which damaged his eye was. Laser pens aren't just a danger on the ground. Since we last featured them on Fake Britain, there's been a reported spike in the number of airline pilots being temporarily blinded by increasingly powerful lasers shone into their cabins. Steve Landells was a pilot for over two decades. He's now flight safety specialist at BALPA, the British Airline Pilots Association. And he's concerned about the number of laser attacks on aircraft. We've seen the, the number of laser attacks on UK aircraft gradually increase over the years. Last year, the Civil Aviation Authority has told us that there were over 1,400 laser illumination events on UK aircraft in the UK. Now, that's more than four a day. In one recent incident, a Virgin Atlantic pilot was forced to return his New York-bound plane to Heathrow after a laser beam was shone in his eyes and caused retinal damage. The problem is, when you shine a laser at an aircraft, not only are you breaking the law, you're endangering lives. Landing an aircraft at night is a demanding manoeuvre. If all of a sudden you end up with this bright flash in the cockpit, then you've lost your night vision. So your only option then as a pilot is to hand over control to the other pilot in the hope that they haven't been affected as badly as you have. Potentially, you're putting the lives of everyone on board that aircraft in danger. Steve is concerned about rapid advances in laser technology. The power of the lasers is increasing so rapidly. A few years ago, you, the most powerful lasers were a few hundred milliwatts, and now we're seeing lasers well over two, three, four watts, 50, 100, even 120 times more powerful, but they're still being advertised as one milliwatt. Despite the nationwide crackdown on the sale of powerful laser pens, potentially dangerous fakes are still widely available for sale online. Just going onto the internet now, here's one, a one milliwatt, laser. It, it may well be one milliwatt, but it talks about military grade and 10 mile range. It's either one thing or the other. It's either super high powered or it's one milliwatt. This is a big worry. When people are buying what they think are one milliwatt lasers, they're actually getting things that are far more powerful. Cheap lasers like this, which could appeal to children, are often more powerful than they claim to be. But it's not just the fakes Steve's concerned about. People actively seeking weapons grade lasers are also spoiled for choice. He's managed to buy a dangerously powerful laser pen online. Because it's labelled and sold as far more powerful than one milliwatt, it's illegal for anyone to sell this laser. But it's not illegal to carry it. In my right hand, I have a one milliwatt laser. Now, that is deemed by Public Health England to be a safe level of power for a laser. And this sort of thing you get in presentation, that's the sort of thing that is OK. In my left hand, I have something completely different. Now, this is 2,500 times the power of that. Now, this can injure someone, injure someone's eye at nearly a kilometre. It's a weapon, and, and there's no need for it to be available to the public. Steve had the laser pen tested, and the results were even worse than he thought. The scientist who tested said he had never seen anything quite like this. It's actually a very well-made laser, very long range, and uh, it has no use other than as a weapon. So actually, I've disabled it by taking the battery terminals out of here, so this can never be used as a laser again. We just kept the shell to show what is available and really what shouldn't be available. Steve's findings and his experience as an airline pilot with hundreds of passengers' lives in his hands is leading him to push for a change in the law. So we're looking to have a law introduced that it gives the police the power to stop and search. And if anyone's carrying something like that, we'd be looking for prison sentences. When you're going on holiday, there's a lot to think about. If you're flying, then parking the car at the airport can be a time-consuming hassle you can do without. That's why more of us are using airport meet and greet services. Turn up 
hand over the keys and your car is driven to a secure locked compound so it's kept safe until you return. But what if the company's promises are fake? Do you really know what's happening to your car while you're away? Richard Bone from Reading takes care of his car. It's a nice new Mercedes. He was due to jet off on holiday and needed to find a safe and reliable way of dropping his car off at Gatwick Airport. Richard searched online and found an airport meet and greet parking service called Air Parking Limited. It was a very professional looking site with all the certificates all over it and it looked really a professional firm um, and that was the thing that I was going for, something that was secure and, and, and looked good. Air Parking Limited made promises on their website to park customers' cars in a proper, secure car park with regular security patrols. Richard assumed his car would be safe. One of the things we were looking for was really the 24-hour the security in, in a secure environment so we could leave our car with peace of mind. So Richard booked the service, dropped the car off with Air Parking Limited's representative and boarded his flight, thinking his car was being well cared for. When he got back from holiday, there was a problem. When we took the car to the airport, it was nice and clean, uh, in perfect condition. Uh, when it got returned to us, it was uh, covered in, in mud. I was very annoyed when I saw the state of the car and actually said to the guy that was dropping it off, um, but he said, oh, well, it's nothing to do with him and, uh, and just gave me the keys and left. Richard was suspicious. Why would there be mud on his car if it had been parked in a clean, secure car park? So he decided to investigate. Luckily, like many motorists, Richard has a dashboard camera fitted to his car for insurance purposes in case he has an accident. The camera works by as soon as you turn the ignition on, it starts recording and just keeps recording all the time you're driving. The automatic dash cam had recorded everything that had happened to the car while Richard was away on holiday. So he sat down and watched. Looking at the chap driving out of the uh, short-term car parking at Gatwick Airport. The speed's up in the top corner there. It's uh, 20, 32 miles an hour at the moment. As the meet-and-greet employee driving Richard's car begins the journey back from the airport to the car park, it seems he's not alone. This is where he seems to be racing with the white car in front of him. So I think it is one of their other drivers, uh, so he's kind of racing him back to the parking. The two drivers are clearly enjoying racing their clients' powerful cars at ever-increasing speeds. This is where they really start to put their foot down now, and you can see the white car's sped off. He's doing 70 miles an hour to catch him up. And as he comes underneath the bridge, he's doing 80 miles an hour. And then outside the bridge, and the speed now is 107. Keeps speeding down the road, 110, flying past cars, 117.6, as he tears down a very busy stretch of dual carriageway. The man is racing at almost 50 miles an hour over the speed limit in Richard's car. He appears to give no thought at all to either the car or the safety of other road users. If he'd been caught at this speed, he'd have received an automatic driving ban. He's doing 84 miles an hour then, uh, down a tiny country lane with side roads and people's drives. Um, a cyclist or a horse or something like that wouldn't stand a chance the way he's kept driving. He jumps over a, a bridge there where the car almost leaves the road. He's just driving insanely. Eventually, Richard's car arrives at the apparently secure place where it'll be parked while he's on holiday. Except it's not a secure car park at all. It's a field. This is advertised as secure car parking with 24-hour monitored car parking area. And as you can see from this shot, this is just an open field. You can see there's no fencing, lighting or security whatsoever. I was furious, absolutely furious. I couldn't believe someone would do this to my car when I handed it over to them and made them responsible for it. And uh, then for them to treat my car like this was, was just appalling. The promises the company had made on their website were completely fake. But Richard wasn't the only one to have his car dumped in a field. Over at West Sussex Trading Standards, Officer Richard Sargent had been receiving dozens of complaints about Air Parking Limited. 
We had quite a few complaints coming in from consumers who had been, in their mind, ripped off because they had suspicions that these cars that they had been parked in unsecure locations. Some customers suspected company employees were using their expensive cars for long-haul personal journeys. Some vehicles had excess mileage. Um, we're talking sort of between 500 and 1,000 miles extra over a week period. In truth, customers had no idea what their cars might have been used for. Even worse, some cars were returned damaged and in some cases not returned at all, as they'd apparently been stolen. So, Trading Standards decided to investigate. They booked a car in with Air Parking Limited and fitted it with a tracking device so they could see what happened after it left the airport. Would the service they received live up to the claims on the website? The company parked it in a location which was not far from the airport, but it was certainly not secure. Our officers managed to walk up to the car into this location. We managed to uh, take photographs and we were unchallenged. So anybody could walk up to the car and touch it or scratch it or even break into it. Trading standards now had clear evidence that the company was breaking its promises about keeping customers' cars secure. We went to the car park where Richard's car and countless others had been dumped. Well, this is the location the officers went to. This was filled with cars parked by Air Parking Limited. And at the time we came, this gate wasn't here. It was all open, so anybody could walk in. On closer inspection, there was no sign of the CCTV cameras or security fencing promised by the airport parking company on its website. This is where we found the very expensive cars, Range Rovers and Audis and Mercedes, which were either unlocked or they had car windows down, so anybody could access them. As the officers explored the site unchallenged, they found something even more worrying. We saw buckets filled with car keys and, surprise, surprise, these actually were the car keys for the vehicles on site. The keys were literally left in a bucket in the open air. Anybody could walk in to this field from the roadside and help themselves to whatever key they wanted. The team had never seen anything like it. There was no security in place. There was nobody patrolling the area whatsoever. So the claims the company were making were totally fake. The directors of Air Parking Limited pleaded guilty to eight charges of misleading customers and were fined £6,000 and ordered to pay back another £34,000 under the Proceeds of Crime Act. But they're not the only fake airport parking company out there. Fake Britain has seen reports of fake parking companies at Heathrow and Manchester airports too, with cars left unsecured or returned with too many miles on the clock and sometimes even badly damaged. The trade sector, we're still carrying on with their investigations. We've still got some live cases going ahead. Traders are acting very shoddily, and the detriment to consumers is significant. They've got expensive vehicles, and they're trusting these companies to do a good job. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Richard clearly picked the wrong company, but he's still counting his blessings. The way that the company abused the car potentially could have damaged the car, but more importantly, could have quite easily killed somebody or had a serious accident in the way that they were driving uh, was extremely irresponsible. All of these have been seized by trading standards. They're cracking down on fakes across the country, not only because they're illegal and are conning the public, but also because many are dangerous. Fake Britain followed one operation in London which had some very surprising results. It's early morning and we're in London. Yeah, OK. Trading Standards Officer David Hunt is leading a crackdown on potentially dangerous fake products thought to be on sale in high street shops. Looking for goods that are unsafe um, and cause a risk to consumers. We're also looking for goods that reach trademarks. Fake goods is a constant battle. I'm surprised at how many goods get faked and it's always changing the styles and the brands. Graham Mogg from the anti-counterfeiting group is particularly concerned about the safety of fake electrical goods. Well, some of the products, especially electrical products, are obviously not tested and they're not as safe as the ones that should be on the UK market. 
Uh, so we, we've had instances where people have uh, injured themselves, electrocuted themselves. Uh, in some cases, I've actually had some fatalities because of it. OK, let's go and do it. With the briefing over, it's time to hit the shops to see if they can find any dangerous fakes. David straight into the first shop on his list. You know who I am. They're doing inspection of your premises. Any goods that we find that are counterfeit or unsafe are going to be seized. The team immediately stumble upon an array of fake fashion brazenly out on display and ready for sale. Graham Mogg is pleased with the first discoveries. We've uh, found a whole range of coffee products from, um, uh, from belts and accessories, car phone covers, handbags, clothing, shirts, T-shirts, jackets, the whole range of coffee products. So that's 400 watches that are fake. Fake Rolex and fake Chelsea. But the team are going to have a look a little harder to find some of the other fakes concealed in the shop. We just have a look, Colin, and see there's a light switch on the back. Yeah. When the lights go on downstairs, it becomes clear there's a panoply of fakery. It's full of phone covers, mobile phone accessories. A lot of it is fake. So we're going to be here quite a lot longer than we expected. The basement room leads on to another one, deep inside the shop. And it just keeps going back under the road. It's here that Dave finds some fakes that could be harmful to health. Not Apple earpod boxes. The earpods may be dangerous because they may not have a noise cancelling feature in them um, and they may actually damage people's hearing. As we can see on a loading bay here, this has come in from Hong Kong. It's the rabbit wall in these places. It's just amazing what's stashed away, hidden away. Round the corner, Dave spotted more dangerous fakes. So that's, that's e-cigarettes. The possibility is they are fake. They could be very dangerous. Um, there have been cases of the batteries exploding in fake e-cigarettes. Before long, it's clear these are not the only potentially dangerous fakes in the shop. There are also what have been called legal highs on sale, covered in fake trademarks. There's various types here. There's that one with a Batman logo, it's called Dark Knight. The other one, look at that, Pingu. Trading standards are particularly concerned that these fake drugs appear to be aimed at children. Unfortunately, people can end up hospitalised, in comas. And if that is not child appealing, I don't know what it is. And that's a real, real worry. These drugs were seized on trademark grounds. Since filming, legal highs have been made illegal. Back them up separately, please. The team have also come across some potentially explosive fake electronics, like this adapter. The markings are wrong. There's no manufacturer, proper manufacturer's details on here. Looking at it, you'll be able to insert it into a plug and have one of the sockets still live. It wouldn't fit safety regulations. It could cause death. Somebody could get electrocuted um, just in using this normally. Fake lithium phone batteries can be accidents waiting to happen. In this case, one already has. You can see it's, it's swollen up, it's soft, it's actually failed inside. If that was actually put on charge, it could very easily explode. Your premises had lots of goods that were counterfeit. Those goods have been seized. We've seized a significant quantity of fake goods, and a number of those fake goods have been very dangerous. It's shown the problems in the area. It's shown the wide range of brands and types of goods that we've seized, um, and it's work that has to be ongoing. It's been a successful day for trading standards with two van loads of fake products off the high street shelves. Investigations are ongoing. This is a seat belt, and so is this. But as you can see, it's not like the ones most of us put on every day when we drive. It's called a racing harness, and it's used by drivers who like putting their foot down in their own car on a track day at a racing circuit. It provides extra safety for the demands of fast driving. Thousands of these are sold every year, and they're not cheap. But as you might have guessed, 
This one isn't going to keep anyone safe. It's a fake. This is a track day. It's where anyone can drive their own car to its limits, experiencing the thrill of whizzing around a circuit like a Formula One pro. And they're becoming increasingly popular. Over 10,000 drivers a year now turn up to days like this one to enjoy the thrill of speeding faster than is allowed on a public highway. Ed Moore is the race director at this circuit at Castle Coombe in Wiltshire. We have builders, farmers, accountants, city traders, all sorts of people. And it's a chance for them to stretch the legs of their road-based cars in the right way. Many drivers customise their road cars and add safety features, of which one of the most crucial is the safety harness. You can get the odd incident where people make a mistake, um, but if they've got the right equipment, the right seat, uh, and, a, and a good harness, then there's a very strong chance that they're going to be perfectly OK. Just hurt pride. Les Burdett is an accountant from Bristol. He got into track racing five years ago. Les reaches speeds of well over 100 miles an hour. And at that lick, it's no surprise that accidents... ..like this near miss just in front of Les... ..do happen. I've had spins. We all have spins occasionally. I have seen cars in the barriers. That's probably the nightmare for any track driver. Because of the risk of a crash, drivers need to be properly protected. So, Les has installed all the safety gear that he needs. This is my four-point harness. The bottom section does up across the lap. The shoulder straps clip into the top. That holds you back into the seat. And if I was unfortunate and had an impact, I'm not going anywhere. It's very, very safe. Les bought a genuine belt that will keep him safe. But there are fake harnesses for sale, designed to look exactly like the genuine ones. Buy a fake harness and your safety in a car crash might not be guaranteed. Gareth Slay is director of GSM Performance, which specialises in harnesses and other motorsport safety gear. Fake equipment has become a problem. There's a lot of auction sites that do sell these at very, very good prices. Um, they're very good because they're probably not real in most cases, and we've seen a, a lot of them on there. Genuine harnesses are carefully designed, built and tested to ensure they'll protect the driver in a high-speed crash. With the fakes, looks can be deceptive. There's only a handful of key manufacturers in this industry, uh, and generally these companies have been doing it for 40, 50 years and constantly developing them to ensure that they're as safe as they can be, whereas the companies that are making the fakes try to make them look similar but not really function the same. So it may look fantastic, but the functionality within the fixings and the buckles are what's failing, and that's the critical part of the belt. One of the main brands being faked is called Takata. So we've got two different Takata belts here, uh, the genuine one and we've got a fake one. Uh, well, for a start, the belt buckle. Uh, the fixings are completely different. They've essentially used a metal mounting point into the, the back of the buckle, uh, whereas the genuine Takata actually uses the webbing which goes through the back of it. The next obvious difference is the uh, spreader plate. So this material and the load spreading is to distribute the weight evenly across your waist. They've not even put that on this one. Without a load spreader in a high-speed crash, the fake seatbelt could cut into the driver's abdomen, causing serious internal injuries. The actual bolting points to the vehicle have used a metal end with sort of a plastic coating over some steel. Uh, the bolt points on the genuine one are just a much better design. Uh, the webbing's been folded correctly to give it more strength. If the harness is not securely fixed to the car, there's every chance that the force of a crash could cause it to give way. Back at the circuit, Ed Moore's concerned about fake harnesses making their way into cars here. If you're wearing a harness which is going to break suddenly, um, then you can move a lot in the car. You can whack your head on the, on the steering wheel. You, know, you can break your neck, break your arms, legs. It doesn't bear thinking about. It's Trading Standards Officer Roger Edmonds job to ensure the public's protected from dangerous products. So when he heard that large quantities of suspected fake racing harnesses were being sold online, he was concerned. 
One of the UK approved dealers contacted us and told us that he thought that somebody in our area was actually selling these fake harnesses. Uh, they had some concern that uh, they'd seen them being sold um, on eBay. The retailer was selling harnesses from top brands, including Takata, Sparco and Sabel. The first step was to establish whether the harnesses being sold were actually fake. So, the team bought one of each brand and examined them. It was very difficult on it, just visual inspection to tell whether the harnesses were fake or not. They had the um, test logo stitched into them as if they'd been tested by an accredited test house. And the general appearance and quality of the product looked very good, to be honest. The fake safety label could easily have fooled a member of the public into thinking this harness was safe. But trading standards wanted to see how the fake harness would perform in the event of a serious accident. So, they tested it by simulating a car crash at 50 miles an hour. A crash test dummy, which was used in the harness in an impact situation, broke down completely under test, with the total obliteration, basically, of the crash test dummy. This is the crucial moment when the racing harness mounting points fail catastrophically. The implication for use by a human being was obvious. Roger knew he had to take the trader out of operation before any dangerous fake harnesses could find their way into cars of unsuspecting drivers. Obviously, our immediate cause for concern was how many had been sold and the horrific nature of the implication if these had been used and an accident had occurred. Roger got a warrant and raided the seller's property. And when we got there, we found uh, two or three harnesses and computer and phone evidence that he had actually been selling them in a widespread way and unfortunately we found that he was selling not just in the UK but in mainland Europe as well. Thanks to the evidence seized, the seller is now facing a criminal prosecution. But Trading Standards has no idea how many dangerous fake harnesses have been sold. Our great concern is that there are some still out there where people could be using them in rallies and they do have an impact and these products would break down and we're trying our very best to get them recovered. Fake Britain wanted to find out what experienced drivers like Les Burdett made of the fake harness test. Oh my God, is that really something that somebody was selling? That's dreadful, absolutely dreadful. It yeah. just breaks away at the bottom and then strangles the guy. That is unbelievable. So you can imagine that um, a broken neck is probably going to be the least of your worries in that sort of accident. Driving at speed with a fake harness would be much like being a skydiver with a 40 parachute. It would be that serious. That's all from Fake Britain. Goodbye.